Hey, Mr. P. This video is all about ecological pyramids. So in the last video, we talked about trophic levels, we talked about food chains and food webs, and so now we're going to kind of take that information one step further and talk about how those levels of feeding relationships are um, illustrated in terms of their ecological pyramids. Trophic levels, like I stated in the last video, each step in a food chain or food web is a trophic level. We use terms like primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and quaternary consumer. We've used in previous videos information or terms like detritivore, decomposer, carnivore, herbivore. All of those are really important terms to keep in mind as we talk through not only trophic levels, but talk through their ecological pyramids and what those ecological pyramids look like. In the last video, I used this image when we talked about food chains, and you know that we talked in depth about all of these trophic levels, producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer, all of those are trophic levels. But now we're going to start talking about how to put those levels into a pictorial representation of how they are structured in an environmental setting. So we use energy pyramids to illustrate the concept of energy loss and feeding relationships and how much energy there is at each of the levels as it pertains to a particular environment. The reason that it is a pyramid because as we travel up a food chain, the amount of energy at each level decreases by a pretty substantial amount. Most of the energy that is available to an organism in its food is going to be lost as heat just in the day-to-day -day cellular energetic and the day-to-day -day activities. There is 100% of the solar energy. Remember, energy comes from the sun and it runs in a one-way direction from sun through the organisms on the planet. And so at the producer level, remember that is the base of every food chain, they have at their disposal 100% of the solar energy that is reaching them. When the sun is shining and when it's daytime, the solar energy is transmitting through space from the sun and is hitting the leaf of every plant on the planet, assuming that plant is in the sun. A hundred percent of that energy is transferred from the sun to the producers at the primary producer level. Their cellular energetics are not a hundred percent efficient, so while they are receiving a hundred percent of the sunlight that they are receiving, they can't turn every bit of that into usable energy for the next level. Some of the energy is used within their cells to keep their cells alive, some of the energy in their cells is used to transport nutrients and minerals and materials around the cell. Some of the energy at that level is just used to help them grow. Some of it is lost as heat. When the primary producers are consumed by the primary consumers, in this case the grasshopper, 100% of the energy in that primary producer level is not transferred as usable energy to the primary consumer. Roughly 55% of the energy the grasshopper consumes is going to be lost is heat completely unusable by the grasshopper in this particular situation. So that leaves roughly 45% of every amount of food that that grasshopper consumes is usable to some extent by the grasshopper. 55% already lost is heat, 45% remains. Of that 45%, roughly 30 to 35% of that energy is going to be used by the grasshopper to keep it alive, to do its normal cellular energetics, to produce energy, to move materials around their cell, to move the organism with muscle contraction. All of those things take energy and it's used. It's gone. So that leaves roughly 10% from that original 100% of food they consume, which is stored and can be therefore consumed by the next organism on this specific food chain which is the frog in the secondary consumer level. That frog is going to lose roughly 55% of the energy it consumes as heat. It therefore uses 35% to keep itself alive, to do its normal cellular energetics, to produce energy, muscle contraction, neuron transmission, all of those things require energy. That leaves again roughly 10% of the energy the frog consumes available to the next level, in this case the snake, which is in that tertiary consumer level. We use the 10% rule, which you can see here, 100, to 10, to 1, to 0.1, and if we went to the quaternary consumer, it would be 0.01% because only 10% of the energy available at each level is transferable from one level to the next. 55% lost as heat. That is a substantial loss of the energy available to each of the organisms at each of the levels. Now, 
each of these organisms can die and do die, and so all of the levels feed the decomposers, which recycle the nutrients back to the primary producers because these producers are going to take all of those recycled nutrients which are returned to the soil and turn them back into biomass and turn them back into organic materials. But 10% from the previous level is transferred to the next level. So 10% from the primary producers transferred to the primary consumer, which is 10%. 10% of that 10% is transferred to the secondary consumer. So we're at 1%. That 1% is reflective of how much energy is at this level from that original 100% of the solar energy given to the primary producers. 10% of this 1% is transferred to the tertiary consumer, which is now why we're at 0.1%. Again, 0.1% of the energy from this original 100 is transferred to the, the tertiary consumer. That is why the shape of this pyramid is in fact a pyramid, because the amount of energy continually decreases over time. This is also why you finally get to a point, and it's why uh, food chains can't progress indefinitely. There has to be a limit to the length of these food chains because eventually you get to a point where there just isn't enough energy to transfer to the next level. And so it doesn't make any ecological sense for an organism to be feeding at a fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth consumer in a collective food chain. There just isn't enough energy to transfer. Pyramids of energy show the relative amount of energy available at each trophic level of a food chain or food web. Again, it is showing you the amount of energy that is available at each trophic level, and that energy is roughly 10% of the, the level below it, the 10% rule. Ecological numbers pyramid is still a pyramid. However, you'll notice that there is no energy designation for each level. Instead, we are talking about actual organism numbers. So you'll see in a pyramid like this that there is 100,000 leaves in whatever environment of this particular food chain. 100,000 leaves will support 10,000 caterpillars. 10,000 caterpillars can support 100 blue tits, which is a, a smaller bird, and 100 of these smaller birds can support one falcon. Again, if we go 100,000 to 10,000 to 100 to 1, you can see that it is decreasing in size every level, and we eventually get to a stopping point or a situation in which we just cannot support another organism that feeds on the organism at this highest level, okay? Again, in this left pyramid, this is still a numbers pyramid, you can see that there is way more acacia trees to support a smaller number of drafts, which supports yet an even smaller number of lines. Every time you go up a level on an energy uh, or numbers pyramid, you are decreasing the amount of energy or decreasing the number of organisms that feed at that particular level. A pyramid of numbers is a model that shows the relative number of individual organisms at each trophic level in a particular ecosystem. Ecological biomass pyramid is the same kind of situation. We're still talking about a pyramid. We're still going to decrease the amount at every level. We, just like in the other two pyramids, get to a point where we can't divide or can't feed on the top organism or the top level any further. And so it doesn't matter if you're talking about an aquatic ecosystem or a terrestrial ecosystem. Ecological biomass mass pyramids account for the actual physical mass of the organisms that feed at that particular level. So if we were to filter out all of the phytoplankton in this particular aquatic ecosystem and mass it, basically the dry mass, the weight of all of the phytoplankton in this particular zone or situation, we would get in this case 1 million kilograms. That 1 million kilograms of phytoplankton can support 100,000 kilograms of zooplankton. This much zooplankton supports 10,000 kilograms of herring, and 10,000 kilograms of herring can support 1,000 kilograms of sea lion. Now, 1,000 kilograms might actually be one sea lion. In a terrestrial ecosystem, if we were to pick all of the blades of grass that make up this particular zone, we would weigh those grass blades to 15,200 kilograms of grass. That can support 1,520 kilograms of grasshoppers. That much mass of grasshopper can support 152 kilograms of mice. And this much mice can support 15.2 kilograms of snake, which, depending on the snake, might be just a handful. This is ecological biomass pyramids. A pyramid of biomass is a model that illustrates the relative amount of living organic matter in each trophic level of an ecosystem. This is weighing every organism that feeds at that particular level to get an accurate weight of how much mass there is of that organism at that particular level. That's it for this video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. If you have a question, leave it in the comments. Subscribe. We'll see you later.